I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Eric Singh. Eric Singh is a hematologist who focuses on non-malignant hem hematology and thromboembolic disorders. He works at St. Michael's Hospital and is actively involved in clinical practice, research, and quality initiatives related to thrombosis care. He has been involved in various continuing education activities through Thrombosis Canada and the American Society of Hematology. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Singh. Well, thank you, David. Uh, first of all, it's, it's my absolute um, honor and privilege to meet you all today. This was supposed to be an in-person event, and then unfortunately, as you know, uh, circumstances have changed over the past year, um, but I'm really delighted that um, that you could all join uh, for tonight's session. Uh, I also appreciate that it's a Wednesday night, which is pizza night in my household. So um, again, I appreciate your time, any time that you can spend with us tonight. So today we're going to be speaking about thrombosis, what you need to know. And um, the first, the structure of the session will be that we'll spend the first half 30 to 40 minutes, just going through some general principles about what thrombosis is, what blood clotting is. And then we've reserved lots of time at the end for questions. Uh, and as David mentioned, uh, please do feel free to use the chat function within the uh, browser if you have any questions that I can address for you as we go along. Uh, these are my disclosures. I do not have uh, any consultancy or advisory board um, activities to disclose and I'm an employee of St. Michael's Hospital. These are our objectives for our session today. So I am really hoping that we can achieve three things that you can take away with you today. The first is that by the end of the session, I do hope that you will be able to describe the signs and symptoms of a blood clot. We have some pictures of this, but also a video uh, that will help to illustrate this, I hope, uh, clearly. The second thing I'd like to focus on is just describing situations when one might be at increased risk of developing a blood clot. And secondarily, what strategies you can think about to try to prevent this from happening. And the third option, the third uh, aspect we'll be speaking about is just discussing different options for treating a blood clot if you happen to be diagnosed with one. And then we'll talk about the different options at that point. So uh, let's start with a quiz. Um, we have two individuals here on the screen. Uh, and I'll be honest, you can tell that uh, I was born in the 1980s. And so I didn't know who the person on the left was, but um, I'm sure you know that that's Jimmy Stewart. Uh, David actually was laughing at me that I didn't know who this was, but there you have it. Uh, on the right is Chris Bosch, a basketball, former basketball player from the Toronto Raptors. And this is Serena Williams, uh, who is still actively a tennis player on the WTA. And then finally, we have Hillary Rodham Clinton, whom you all know quite well. So these uh, four individuals and many others have actually all developed venous thrombosis previously. And so this is just to illustrate that, uh, that this disorder is more common than we think and is often even in the, in the mainstream media. So what is thrombosis? So thrombosis is uh, the medical term for blood clotting. And what's happening is thrombosis is the formation of a blood clot, which is also known as a thrombus, which occurs within a blood vessel. If you can imagine the blood vessel is like a tube and then you have blood cells passing through. So in the, in the picture here, it's like a highway and you've got cars that are trying to get through. And you can imagine if there's a traffic jam, then the cars can't get through and things get stuck. And that's what's happening with a blood clot. You might have a vein in your leg, for example, which is the highway, and you have blood trying to get back to the heart. That's the way that the blood is supposed to go. And for some reason, if the body is prone to developing a clot for some reason or another, the blood can't flow properly, it gets stuck, and then there's a backlog. And so that's what we're seeing with this picture here are, are these red blood cells trying to get through and they're angrily saying that they can't get through. Uh, so why do we care about thrombosis or blood clotting? Well, thrombosis is the one disorder that causes the world's top three cardiovascular uh, causes of death. So if you look at heart attack, stroke, and venous thrombosis, so the first two heart attack and stroke are blood clots within the arteries, and then venous thrombosis is in the veins. These are two different types of blood vessels. You can see that 
all of these three disorders involve the formation of blood clots. And if you look at people in general, one in four people worldwide are uh, uh, unfortunately passing away from conditions that are linked to or caused by thrombosis. So again, heart attack, stroke, and venous thromboembolism. So this is an important thing to be aware of and to think about. Why do you need to know about thrombosis? So for those of you who have used Twitter in the past, uh, we, there is this no thrombosis hashtag. And in particular, why do Canadians need to know about thrombosis? As we mentioned, one in four deaths are caused by thrombosis and up to 10,000 deaths in Canada annually are also caused by thrombosis. Furthermore, 100,000 Canadians affected every year by thrombosis as well. So this is a major public health issue. And something else I wanted to highlight is that up to 60% of all thrombosis can be the result of hospitalization, either for surgery or for some other medical illness. Again, this is over half of blood clots being caused as a result of thrombosis. And so this is, as we think about the, when to worry about a potential thrombosis happening, this would be one of those high risk periods. If you're being admitted to hospital or if you have a family member who is recently being discharged from hospital. Uh, also in patients who have cancer, thrombosis is the second leading cause of death. So again, in that particular group of people, this is a really important thing to think about and, and to think about preventing if at all possible. So what is venous thrombosis? Because we talked about a heart attack. Most of us, I think, know what a heart attack is and a stroke is a blood clot in the brain. But venous thrombosis, I don't think gets quite as much attention as those other disorders. And I often find in, in clinic, when I describe these disorders to patients, they often have no, no real knowledge before it happens about what it actually was. So uh, venous thrombosis is actually comprised of two main um, problems. The first is a clot in the veins of the leg. That's in the middle here, and that's called a deep vein thrombosis. And the second is something called a pulmonary embolism or a PE. A pulmonary embolism is a clot that occurs in the veins of your lungs. So again, uh, in the middle here, uh, the blue lines are veins. And if you have a blood clot occurring in the veins, that's a deep vein thrombosis. And this again, prevents blood from returning back upwards towards the heart. A pulmonary embolism is a blood clot that occurs within the lungs. And they're all part of the same disorder because the vast majority, almost all pulmonary embolisms actually come from a deep vein thrombosis initially. So the concern with a deep vein thrombosis is that if it's not treated, it can actually break off and go through the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism. So this is why we think of venous thrombosis as being comprised of these two, these two issues because they actually, they actually come together. And this graphic just demonstrates that 84% of patients know what a blood clot is, but if you actually ask them what a DVT is, the number drops by half. So only 43% of patients know what a DVT is, a deep vein thrombosis. And now that we've discussed what this is, uh, you are now all amongst that 43%, but we're really hoping that we can spread the word and get this number a lot higher than 43%. And again, just to reiterate this, a DVT is a blood clot that forms in the deep veins, primarily in the leg, but it can also occur in the arm as well, which is a lot less common, but there are veins in the arm and the symptoms that we'll describe in a moment of, the, of a leg DVT are also applicable to a DVT in the arm as well, because there are deep veins there too. So what are the symptoms of a DVT? Well, you know, there's lots of things listed here, but just think about logically what would happen. So you have blood trying to get from the leg back up towards the heart. And then we're saying that there's a traffic jam there. So if the blood is not getting back to the heart, imagine what would happen in that situation. Well, the blood isn't really flowing anywhere. And instead what happens is the leg gets swollen. So the blood can't return upwards. And so the pressure kind of builds up and then people end up feeling leg pain because of the swelling there. There's often tenderness and, and ankle edema, which is another word for swelling in the ankle because the clot in the deep veins, eventually the fluid that's trying to get back up towards the heart will go out of the deep veins into the ankle as well. 
And then often people will feel calf swelling as well. Dilated veins means that, you know, some of you may have what are called varicose veins. So those are veins along the, the, the surface of the vein of the leg that, that, that are often quite visible, even if there's no concern with them. But in times of a deep vein thrombosis, you will often see that those superficial veins will often fill up with blood and become quite dilated, which means that they become distended or larger. And again, this is because of pressure building up. And then, and then as a result, that gets transmitted backwards into the veins that are along the superficial uh, aspect of the leg. And then if the blood clot is very significant and in fact impeding the flow of blood into the leg, then you can have what's called a dusky discoloration. So dusky means if the leg, you know, if you look at your leg right now, um, you know, it looks like it's getting good circulation. Um, a dusky means that instead of looking its usual color, that the leg might look purple or it might look um, uh, grayish or pale. And that means that it's not getting enough blood flow. And that's a serious issue uh, in patients who develop deep vein thrombosis. Uh, and as a general rule, people often will often develop redness and then warmth as well, again, because of the same issue with, of the blood, the blood not returning back to the heart and because of that blood clot in that vein. So let's get back to that 84%. So 84% of Canadians, again, they do know what a blood clot is, but only 59% know what a pulmonary embolism is. So a pulmonary embolism, again, is a blood clot that goes to the lung. And as I mentioned before, what happens is a clot usually starts as a deep vein thrombosis in the leg. And then for some reason, which we don't fully understand, to be honest, there are several reasons for why this might happen, but that DVT can actually break off or become dislodged and travel through the bloodstream and then end up in the lung. And so that's a pulmonary embolism. And as a result, these are the symptoms that one might experience. Uh, the first, I would say the most common symptom that we see is shortness of breath. And this might occur gradually or it might occur suddenly. Chest pain. So the surface of the lung is covered in nerve fibers. And often people will experience chest pain because the blood clot that occurs in the veins in the lung uh, with the pulmonary embolism can actually irritate the lining of the lung and cause quite a bit of chest pain. Some people often describe this sensation where the pain gets worse when they take a deep breath. And again, that just reflects the irritation in the lining of the lungs as well. Uh, and that's often a finding that we see in, in people who, are, who have a pulmonary embolism. If a doctor or a nurse was to check the oxygen saturation with one of those oxygen probes, they might also find that the number that you get or what's called the oxygen saturation might actually decrease. And finally, if you were to measure your heart rate, maybe on your Apple iWatch, or if you were to take your pulse, you might see that you have something called tachycardia, which means that there's an abnormally rapid heart rate. There's lots of reasons for this. It might be pain related, but also pulmonary embolism can cause also a bit of strain on the heart. And as a result, the heart will compensate by beating more quickly. And then, so people may often experience a rapid heart rate as well. So again, when I describe this to my patients, I tell them the most common symptoms will be chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, you could certainly have the oxygen levels decrease and then people might feel palpitations or a fast heart rate. Uh, this is what a CT scan looks like. So a CT scan is basically a fancy X-ray and um, when doctors try to diagnose a pulmonary embolism, the way that we diagnose pulmonary embolism is by doing this special type of x-ray. And, uh, and, and what we're seeing here on the left is if you imagine, if you imagine, um, uh, you know, if, if someone's standing upright and you were to take a cut through their lungs, so looking just at the level of the chest from front to back, this is a cross section of the lung here. And you can actually see, oops, you can actually see here uh, so the white is the, pul is the pulmonary artery here, and right in the middle, there's this little layer of black here, uh, and then there's a blood clot. This is blood clot. So you can imagine if there's a blood clot blocking the blood flow in the pulmonary artery, that's going to cause chest pain, shortness of breath, and, and reduce oxygen levels. And then on the right is another picture of the same patient who also has had 
a pulmonary embolism, and this is just a different angle. Now imagine that you're cutting, you're taking uh, an image of the patient from top to bottom, and then uh, you're looking at the patient's chest head on, and you can see again this bit of gray here, and this is a pulmonary embolism. Uh, so how do you remember all of these um, symptoms? Because it's a lot to remember, and I'm, uh, I have a poor memory these days. Um, and so I, th I, I love acronyms, and, and one mnemonic that I think is really helpful is the CLOTS uh, mnemonic. So Thrombosis Canada has had this campaign for uh, a few years now called CLOTS, and this, uh, this word helps remind you about what the symptoms of a blood clot are. And again, it's easy to remember because the word is clots after all. So let's go through them one by one and remember just C-L-O-T-S. So the first C is for chest pain. And again, as we mentioned, this is if a, if a blood clot um, blocks blood flow to the part of your lung. And then this can result in chest pain, especially when people are taking a deep breath because that part of the lung has become quite inflamed. The second symptom can be lightheadedness. So this is what the L stands for. Uh, we didn't talk about this in the symptoms initially of pulmonary embolism, but you can imagine, um, you know, it all, everything is this in, in, in a circuit. So uh, the, the blood flow that goes through the lungs eventually has to go back to your heart. And the heart, as you know, pumps blood to everywhere else in your body. So it goes lungs and then heart and then the rest of your body. So if you have a large pulmonary embolism that is actually blocking blood flow in the lungs, you will not have enough blood flow getting back to your heart. The heart pumps blood to your brain, and so there's not enough blood going to your brain, then you might feel lightheaded. And some people actually faint as a consequence of having had a blood clot. This is a medical emergency, and so this is another reason why if you or a family member experiences severe lightheadedness uh, or, or even loses consciousness, uh, it would be advisable to go to the hospital. And, and this is one of these symptoms that can be a signal of a pulmonary embolism. Out of breath. So out of breath or shortness of breath, uh, we discussed this already, but if you have a lack of blood flow to the lung, this can result in reduced oxygen levels. And then as a result, uh, people will often feel short of breath. Uh, as one of their main symptoms. So these three symptoms are the result of a pulmonary embolism. That's the C, L, and O. And then the last two refer to um, deep vein thrombosis. So the first is tenderness. So leg tenderness would be a, a symptom of deep vein thrombosis, which we already mentioned. And then finally, leg swelling. So we already talked about this. If you have a lack of blood flow uh, returning back to the heart, then the leg will often swell as, as a result. And this can be reflected both in calf swelling or even ankle swelling as well. So chest pain, lightheadedness, out of breath, leg tenderness, and leg swelling. Uh, I think this is easy to remember. And uh, I actually have a number of these bookmarks in my office. And, and, and I, I, I give them out to patients, actually, because I think it's, it's a nice way of remembering what the symptoms are. Let's talk about some risk factors for blood clots. So uh, there's many different risk factors, but the main ones that you should remember are on this list here. So hospitalization. We talked about the fact that up to 60% of people will have a, a, a blood clot as a result of a hospitalization. Surgery can increase the risk of clotting as well. So if you have leg swelling or chest pain, uh, within two to four weeks of having had a big surgery, uh, it, this could be the issue of blood clot. A cancer, immobility, and we'll talk a bit more about what that means. Uh, age greater than 60 years old, uh, um, which is a large number of people, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and this, the age itself is not a very strong risk factor for clotting. However, we know that the risk of clotting does increase uh, as, as age increases. Uh, and then if there's a family history of clotting, this can be a risk factor for clotting. And then finally, uh, the use of hormones, including the birth control pill or hormone replacement therapy can also be a risk factor for clotting as well. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge, I know there's a number of questions that have built up so far. 
I, just to reiterate, uh, I'm happy to answer these questions. Uh, I'm just going to leave them till the end, just to make sure that we have enough time to go through them in the detail that they deserve. Thank you. Uh, we talked a bit about cancer. So if you compare people, uh, a patient who does not have cancer and a patient who has cancer, uh, the patient who has cancer has about a five-fold greater increase in the risk of having thrombosis, which is VTE, which is venous thromboembolism, a five-fold increase in having a venous thrombosis than the person who doesn't have cancer. And there's a number of different reasons for why cancer and blood clots often come together. It likely has to do with the type of tumor, chemotherapy, hospitalization, um, and many other risk factors uh, associated with, with the cancer and the treatment of cancer, unfortunately. Uh, what about immobilization? So thrombosis risk is up to 22 times higher for a patient who is immobilized after cancer surgery than a patient who doesn't have cancer. So immobilization, not moving around in general, can be a risk factor for thrombosis, but in particular, after surgery, um, it, it can be a significant risk factor for clotting. And, and that's because uh, if you've just been through a surgery um, and you're not moving around much, the blood in the, in the legs may not move quite as well. And as a result, this can lead to actually to blood clots and deep vein thrombosis. And in fact, uh, for some different, for, for some types of surgery, including cancer surgery, some, sometimes we even discharge people on blood thinners to prevent blood clots from happening even after they go back home. What about hormones? So uh, this is uh, another handout from Consumer Health Digest and, and it talks about uh, the risks of hormone therapy. So there's obviously many good reasons why we would choose to go on hormone replacement therapy or the birth control pill. Um, but there are going to be potential downsides or side effects from that. And one of them is that venous thrombosis or blood clots can happen um, after someone has been started on hormone therapy. And, uh, and this is just a picture of birth control pills. But, uh, but that is something else to keep in mind is that if you have a family member, if you yourself have been started on a hormone therapy of some sort, particularly something that has estrogen in it, this can also increase the risk of clotting, especially in the first six to 12, six months or so after the, the hormone therapy has been started. This question comes up a lot. So what about flights? Well, I don't know about all of you, but I, I do miss being on a plane once in a while, um, but uh, at some point we will be flying again, I hope, um, after we're all vaccinated. And uh, there is a, an increase in the risk of clotting, especially after prolonged flights. So uh, after six to eight hours, uh, the risk of thrombosis does start to increase. Uh, for most people, uh, the risk of this is not high enough that we would recommend uh, any specific um, blood thinning medication for this. Uh, however, uh, if you are someone who has other risk factors for thrombosis, for example, if you're going through cancer treatment, uh, if you have other risk factors, then you might be at someone who might be at increased risk of having a blood clot after a flight. And so you should speak to your doctor about whether there are any preventative measures that can be taken to prevent blood clots from happening um, during the flight or afterwards. And then what about family history? So family history means if you have a first degree relative uh, who has had a blood clot previously, uh, this does increase your risk of having a blood clot as well. Uh, the risk is about twofold higher than someone who doesn't have a family member with a history of clotting. Again, these are uh, risk factors that must be taken into the context of what else, whatever else is happening um, in terms of the medical history. Um, but having a family history does also potentially increase the risk of clotting as well. So uh, what are some treatments for blood clots? Uh, the most common medication that we use in hospital to prevent blood clots is a drug called heparin. So heparin was actually discovered in Toronto, I believe, and um, there are different forms of heparin. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, there's uh, someone who is injecting themselves with a type of heparin called low molecular weight heparin. There are different types of low molecular weight heparin, but if you are someone who needs to be on heparin outside of hospital, it is most likely that you will be receiving heparin in this form. 
And there are specific reasons why we might consider using an injectable blood thinner as opposed to a, a, an oral or pill blood thinner instead. In the hospital, uh, you may be provided with heparin that comes in a bottle form, and then this may be dripped in through a bag, or, or it may also be injected as a needle as well. Uh, warfarin is probably the most famous uh, and long, uh, uh, long known blood thinner. Um, uh, many of my patients refer to this as rat poison. Um, uh, the truth is that rat, rat poison uh, 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 in the old days used to have a component that uh, was similar to, similar to warfarin, but uh, nowadays warfarin, what it is, is it, it antagonizes a vitamin called vitamin K in the body. And it's a highly effective and highly safe blood thinner. We've been using it for over 50 or 60 years now. We don't use it quite as frequently as it used to before because it's not quite as convenient. But there are certainly many reasons why we continue to use warfarin nowadays, and it's probably still the most common uh, blood thinner used, um, uh, certainly over the past 10 or 15 years. Although increasingly, as I said, its, it's use is becoming less and less common. And then what about other pills? So uh, these are four um, oral blood thinners uh, that have been introduced in the past 10 or 15 years. And uh, certainly uh, in the course of my medical training over the past 10 years, it used to be only warfarin and now we mostly use these medications instead. And so you may recognize some of these names, uh, Lixiana, Pardaxa, Xeralta, or Eliquis um, would be the brand names. Uh, and then the generic names are Edoxaban, Dabigatran, Rivaroxaban, and Apixaban. These are all oral blood thinners that one might take once daily or twice daily at different doses, depending on, on why they're being used. Uh, these drugs uh, are quite convenient and they don't require frequent blood or lab monitoring like warfarin would. And so uh, again, this is something if you are, have been taking an anticoagulant, um, these are the different options that we have at the moment. Uh, and uh, if there are more questions about these blood thinners versus the other ones that, that I just talked about, uh, I'm happy to answer them in the, in the question and answer period as well. Uh, what are the consequences of being on a blood thinner? So um, obviously we are concerned about the risk of bleeding and uh, there are what we call minor bleeding issues. And so we often will see in patients who are started on blood thinners that they might have bruising uh, or, or sometimes we might see even some what we call a conjunctival hemorrhage, which is a little bit of bleeding around the eye. Uh, this looks concerning and is obviously, obviously looks quite scary, uh, but these are usually um, minor bleeding issues that typically will, uh, will resolve on their own. Now, blood thinners do carry a risk of what we call more serious bleeding. This would be internal bleeding in the head or in the stomach or the, or the intestines. Uh, these events are less common, but they, they do occur. And your doctor, if he or she is prescribing a blood thinner, will discuss with you the risks of bleeding versus the benefit you would get from being on a blood thinner potentially. 54% uh, of Canadians know that not moving is a risk factor for blood clots, so immo immobility, but only 13% are aware that cancer is a risk factor for thrombosis. So we talked a bit about this before, and just to reiterate that point that uh, then unfortunately, cancer and thrombosis often come together. 54% um, of patients know that not moving is a risk factor for blood clots, but only 17% are aware that hospitalization is. Uh, so again, just speaking to the same points that we talked about before. And then, you know, same trend. Um, surgery is also a risk factor for clotting as well. Um, it, there's the immobility of it, um, the anesthetic, especially if you've been under general anesthesia for more than two or three hours, that can be a risk factor for thrombosis as well. Um, the immobility following surgery, um, if there's any inflammation uh, following the surgery, uh, these can all be um, risk factors associated with clotting. And only 31% of Canadians who are aware of blood clots are concerned about them. So, um, uh, even though they're responsible for one in four deaths. So again, this is just re reiterating that point that, um, that this can be a serious issue and if not dealt with, uh, if they're not recognized, um, can unfortunately have um, severe consequences. 
Uh, I just wanted to put a plug in for World Thrombosis Day. So this is October the 13th. Uh, this is one of my favorite um, days of the year. Um, I think uh, I, I think it's important to raise awareness for these uh, for for this public health issue. And uh, Thrombosis Canada usually does a very good job of um, of raising the awareness around around this important event every year. I just wanted to end with a few slides about thrombosis and COVID-19. I don't know if there are questions uh, relating to this, but uh, this is certainly quite topical. And I just wanted to go through a few finer points about thrombosis and COVID-19, as you may have read about this um, in the news recently. So um, I, I decided to put it in a question and answer format. So the first question often is, uh, I've read that there's a linkage between thrombosis and COVID-19. What is my risk of thrombosis if I am diagnosed with COVID-19, but I have mild to moderate symptoms and I'm staying at home? My answer to this would be that your risk of thrombosis if you have mild COVID infection is low. The risk of having a blood clot in people who have COVID-19 is highest in those who are admitted to hospital. So if you are staying at home and otherwise um, mobile and doing well, the risk of thrombosis is low. If I have COVID-19 and I have mild to moderate symptoms and I'm staying at home, should I be receiving preventative blood thinners? As I mentioned before, you may have read that there is a linkage that has been, been found between thrombosis and COVID-19. But again, because the risk is highest in people who are admitted to hospital with COVID infection, pe people who are at home with a mild infection do not uh, generally require preventative blood thinners as long as they're mobile and uh, otherwise uh, walking around and staying hydrated. So your risk of thrombosis would be low. You do not need preventative blood thinners if you were at home. Next question, what if I have previously had a DVT or a PE and my doctor has told me that I can stop my blood thinner, but now I'm diagnosed with COVID-19, should I be taking a blood thinner again? I would speak to my doctor in this specific situation, but in most circumstances, again, if you have a mild to moderate COVID infection, and you're at home and mobile, uh, we would not generally recommend that you start a pre preventative blood thinner. But again, this can be case, case specific and I would suggest that you speak specifically with your doctor about this. What if I have a family member in a nursing home who has COVID-19 and is unwell? Should they be receiving a blood thinner? So this is a bit of a different scenario. So if you have family members who are in nursing homes, again, this is case specific, but often uh, individuals who are residing in nursing homes may have other risk factors for, blood, for thrombosis. They may not, but they, but they may. And if they're unwell, uh, sometimes it, uh, they may or not be, be transferred to a hospital setting um, for, for a variety of different reasons. And so should they receive a preventative blood thinner? I think this is a bit of a controversial issue. Um, but in general, if that family member is unwell, not mobile, and has other risk factors for clotting, uh, one could consider providing a preventative blood thinner in that situation, as long as there is not a high risk of bleeding. So again, there are re reasons why people would bleed on a blood thinner as well, and so that's the difficult balance here when we make these types of decisions. Uh, what if I have a family member who is admitted to hospital with COVID-19-related illness? should that person receive a blood thinner? My answer is yes. Uh, any patient who is admitted to hospital with COVID-19 should receive preventative blood thinners while they're in hospital because the risk of thrombosis increases when they're admitted to hospital. What if I'm taking blood thinners? Is it safe for me to receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Yes. So uh, I've been receiving many questions over the past couple of weeks about um, whether um, my patient, patient's calling asking whether they should receive the COVID-19 vaccine. And my answer is definitely yes. Just make sure you let your doctor and nurse know that you're taking blood thinners so that they can take appropriate precautions, uh, putting more pressure at the site where the injection happens so that so to, to minimize the risk of bruising. Um, but otherwise it is, it is safe for you to receive any of the four vaccines that are currently available um, in Canada. Uh, I should add, uh, as a corollary to that, um, obviously, before proceeding with the, the vaccine, you know, not knowing the rest of the medical history, you'd want to consult with your, with your doctor just to be sure about that. Uh, I previously had thrombosis or I'm taking a blood thinner. Which COVID-19 vaccine should I receive? 
So at this point, there's no reason to suspect that one vaccine is more effective than any other. Um, so I would suggest that you take which, whichever one is available to you first. And then finally, where can I find out more information about thrombosis and COVID-19? Uh, so if you go to this website, Thrombosis Canada, and you look up the, the, the blood clots and COVID-19 section, uh, there is a, a nice handout and website that goes through many of these questions in detail. And uh, we also had done a webinar um, last year that goes over many of these questions as well, and that's also available on YouTube. Finally, where can you learn more about blood clots and treatments? So we're just skimming the surface today, but there is lots of uh, helpful material on the Thrombosis Canada website. So this has become the go-to hub for anything thrombosis related. Um, many patients, but also most doctors, um, many doctors, I should say, will use this website as a resource. So you can be certain that you're receiving the best information from our, from our website. And so this is www.thrombosiscanada.ca. I go to this website so often that it just auto-populates when I type, when I start putting in TH, it goes right to this website now. And I would encourage you to spend a bit of time looking through the resources on this website. Uh, there is a free mobile app as well. So the mobile app also has lots of really helpful information um, about different treatments and different thrombosis diagnoses. Uh, much of what we discussed uh, today is also uh, to some extent available on, in the app, although perhaps in a different format. Um, but again, I would encourage you to download this website so that you can get the most up-to-date information. And this is available in the in the uh, Apple um, in the Android or the Apple um, uh, app stores. Uh, there are lots of patient-specific resources as well. So drug information sheets, disease information sheets. These handouts are so good that um, that I use them in my own clinic uh, when I see patients. Um, and so I would encourage you to have a look at these as well. They can be they can be really really helpful. Uh, they can help to inform the questions that you ask your physicians as well. Uh, this is an example of aspirin. So aspirin, this is a handout that was developed for Thrombosis Canada. You can see that it has very practical information about what is the drug, why are you taking it, what if you miss a dose, what are the side effects, that type of information as well. Uh, so with that, I wanted to thank you for your attention. And uh, just back to our objectives, uh, we described the signs and symptoms of a blood clot, which is that clot mnemonic. We describe situations when one might be at increased risk of developing a blood clot, which would include surgery, hospitalization, hormone therapy, and cancer. And then we discuss the different treatment options for developing, for treating a blood clot, which would often involve pills or injections.